Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. I'm Beth Rappaport, VP of Business Development in Palm Beach County for Campbell Property Management. We're at Campbell's board member education course designed for current and prospective community association board members, including condos, HOAs, and co-ops. In business since 1953, today Campbell manages over 400 condos and HOAs from Miami-Dade to the Treasure Coast. We take great pride in our work and it shows in our retention of both employees and customers, as well as our online reviews as South Florida's highest rated property management company. I hope you enjoy today's event and look forward to seeing you at our next one. I will be moderating today's class alongside Dan Tiernan, the Chief Operating Officer of Campbell and one of the five owners of the company. Let's get started. Welcome everybody. So listen, if you're new to condo, HOA or co-op board, there's a lot to learn. You need to have a basic understanding of the relevant laws related to managing your community association. Um, you, you also need to understand the key operations in your community. You don't need to understand it exactly how they all work, but you need to understand what the board is ultimately responsible for, including board meetings, financial reporting, budget preparation, annual meetings, and much more. And then finally, you know, what's your role in all this? So Beth, why don't you talk for a minute about uh, the legal side of it? Definitely, the legal part is actually really straightforward. As a board member, you are required by statute to either attend a board certification course, which is focused on all the legalities of your association, or sign a document stating you have read and understand your community's governing documents. So we really recommend that you do both the board certification course and read your documents. And of course, the most important thing to remember is always consult your association attorney. Great, thanks Beth. And just as a reminder to everybody, last year we hosted 15 online board certification courses with local association attorneys for both condos and HOAs between January and May. We plan to do the same thing next year, starting in January, and, we, and we'll be sending out schedules starting in December. So that covers the legal education. We're not gonna really do anything else on that part here today, that's a separate course. So that still leaves us though with the need to understand your community operations, and your roles as board members. So this is a lot of information and it's easy to get overwhelmed. And you may be asking yourself, you know, how do I learn all this? Where do I get all the information? How do I keep up with the changes? You know, trying to figure all of this out can be really stressful. So the good news though, is Campbell has built this board member primer that we're gonna be talking about today. And it was designed precisely for this purpose. The primer is a concise four page document that provides an overview of community management, including your roles as board members. And it highlights all the Campbell educational resources available to help you understand community operations in your role. We'll be sending a link to access the primer to your email uh, after the webinar. So Beth, can you give us some more detail about the content and the primer? Yes, this very handy document includes a variety of things, including an overview of the community association concept and what you should expect. It also includes an explanation of your roles and responsibilities and a high level overview of your fiduciary duty, also known as your responsibility to act in the best interest of your community. We also provide an overview of Florida Association news resources. This is Campbell's one-stop educational resource. And finally, there are 13 featured blog posts specially selected to address some of the most common concerns for board members. We will spend the rest of this morning session to give you an idea of what you'll be learning from the primer. It's really important to understand that there are some unique aspects of serving on a community board. It's unlike any other kind of board you may have been on. No matter how successful you may have been in business, government, politics, military, law enforcement, education, the legal world, or any other world, you can never be fully prepared for your experience on a community association board. It's important to remember these five things about your condo HOA or co-op board. First of all, your community board is a political organization, very political. 
Second, it's run by unpaid volunteers. Third, we've got a lot of shareholders that are heavily invested. Fourth, you can't go home and leave it behind because your job is your home. And last but not least, the shareholders will rarely agree on a common set of goals and objectives. The primer also includes a brief overview of the roles for each officer position. In some cases, your governing documents may also outline the responsibilities for each position, so it's important to be on the lookout for that and be familiar with it. While you're looking at your community documents, you should also notate specifics about annual meetings, budget meetings, and board meetings, because as an officer, you have a key role in these meetings. Near the end of the primer is a list of the 13 highest recommended blog posts for board members. The first two are especially important. Dan, would you like to tell us a little bit more about those? Sure, thanks Beth. So the first one is the seven habits of highly successful board members. So these are the best habits we've seen in the most successful board members that we've worked with. So number one is put community interest first. This is all about your fiduciary responsibility to look out for the best interests of the community and not your personal interests and needs. Number two is seeking consensus. So the best board members are experts at seeking compromise and finding ways to bring people together towards a common goal. Number three is investing in your community. A key responsibility of the board is to maintain the property values of the community which means investing in the common areas and potentially making capital improvements. Number four is trust your manager. So property managers are licensed professionals with years of experience in their field and good managers don't like to be micromanaged. If you can't trust your property manager, then you may not have the right property manager. Number five is over communicate. So the number one complaint we hear from frustrated owners that end up running for the board is lack of transparency. So effective communication with your residents is absolutely essential. And number six is play by the rules. The rules are not made to be broken a condo or an HOA and it's important to lead by example and not be accused of selective enforcement. Also like Beth mentioned earlier, beginning of this, it's real important that you rely heavily on your association attorney to make sure that you don't make any bad decisions that could put the association at risk. And number seven, and this is honestly probably the most important one, is it's just being a good neighbor. So you're a board member, but you're also everybody's neighbor. And you need to treat your neighbors the way you want to be treated and accept the fact that you're going to get criticized and potentially attacked now and again based on the decisions that you've made. Um, but it's really important that you keep cool and try to rem remember that these people are your long-term neighbors and you've got to make sure you maintain that relationship. So the second one is uh, nine steps to an effective board meetings. Well, the reason we put so much energy into trying to explain this is that board meetings are incredibly important. Board meetings are your public display of your performance. If your meeting appears dysfunctional, then your owners are gonna lose confidence. If a meeting run well, it runs well, it instills confidence in the owners. So we'll, I'm not gonna go through all these right now, but I'll tell you that we'll, we'll give you a link to a more detailed blog post where each step is explained in more detail. And in addition to that, a link to a video on this topic as well. So Beth, what are some of the other examples of information board members can expect from the primer? One of the featured blog posts discusses guidelines for meeting minutes. The key point on this and the main thing to remember is that less is more. The blog post also includes an example of well-written and concise minutes. Deanne, what other elements of Florida Association news are covered in the board member primer? Yep, so uh, campbellevents.org is another important one that we'll again send you the link on this. This is where board members and managers can find out and register for upcoming uh, educational webinars. As you can see from this page, there are five classes this month on a wide variety of topics. Today's class on new board member education, a class next week on electronic voting, and others on preventive maintenance, legislative updates, and one on golf carts, ATVs, and scooters and HOA. So a wide variety of things. And then board members can also have access to past educational webinars. So as you can see, we've had three this past month on emotional support animals, media events, 
and a legislative update. And each of these was moderated by a local association attorney. And finally, one other tool uh, on the on as, that's part of Florida Association News or FAN is a search engine. And it provides content on community association topics. So in this example, we typed in movies up here in the top of the search engine. And it the results show four different articles from three different sources that explain legal considerations when hosting movie nights in HOAs or condos in Florida. Like if you type movies in Google, you're gonna get all kinds of stuff about current hot movies and so on. So instead of searching the entire internet, what this does is we've identified about 100 websites that are focused on community associations in Florida. And we limit the search engine to those sites, which makes it a lot easier to find the information you're looking for and you don't have to be an expert in trying to figure out how to use Google search. Okay, so we'd like to take some time to do some questions and answers. So there's one from Kathleen said, uh, clarification on the Florida law and board of director providing 14 day notice to owners. Is this for annual budget meeting, meetings to amend bylaws or covenants, meeting for special assessments, any others? Um, so there's some, I, I'm not sure I wanna to try to remember exactly what, are, what all the notices are for, but there's, there's absolutely, there's a whole series of uh, dates for your annual meeting where it's the annual meeting is 14 days notice actually, but an election is 60 days notice for your first notice. And then there's a second notice. So there's, I'm not gonna try to go through that on here because I might make a mistake, but it's really easy to find and you can talk with your attorney about it because you may even have some other other restrictions in your, in your uh, documents. But in general, it is important to note that those are the more special ones. In general, you just need two days, 48 hours uh, notice for just basic meetings, but all the other ones, the require a, 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 a longer notice. So um, the next one is, are residents able to speak during the meeting or they should be asked to wait to the end of the meeting? Um, so the, the way, the best practice is to let members talk during the meeting after the board finishes discussion on the topic and before the vote. That's what we recommend. You're not really legally required to do it that way, but that's an absolute best practice. And the reality is if you don't do it that way, it's honestly a bit rude. And this is, we cover this in detail in board member and how to run an effective board meeting. Um, because if you, if you don't let people ask questions before you vote and you wait to the end of the meeting, they may have actually had a salient point that should have been considered. So it, it's better to do it during the course of the meeting, but you have to control it as well. And it, it's pretty easy to control as long as you're respectful and you set some rules about time and how and people waiting for the boards to fit to to, to finish their discussion and so on. Um, what are the? Answer, yep. Oh, to answer Jennifer's question on the order of precedence when it comes to HOA documents, first of course you always start with Florida statutes. Then you have your plat or your maps that are recorded with the county followed by the declarations, the articles, the bylaws, and your rules. Yeah, I always remember DAB. That's the only way I can ever remember it. DAB, declaration, articles, bylaws. That's a, absolutely. Um, impact of Florida sunshine laws on condos, please. I think we should leave that for your attorneys to explain to you. There's a lot, <laughs> that's a huge impact. And Beth and I aren't attorneys and we don't wanna be accused of uh, practicing law without a license. You can you can talk to your attorney about that, but there's a there's a lot of overlap. It's not just 718, not just 720 for uh, condos and HOAs. There are, you know, the uh, 617 and others have a big impact as well. Um, what about meetings to review rules and standard documents? Meetings to review rules and standard. So there, if you're gonna change rules, you need certain notice requirements. And again, you should work with your attorney to work through those. We're not trying to cover that today. We're trying to cover more of the basic operations of things that you need to make sure you do and don't do and behave, how to behave effectively and what things to look out for. Um, so that's something that uh, 
you should review with your attorney. Um, clarification on Zoom versus in-person regular board meetings. Do we want to abolish Zoom, but residents are complaining? Do need to have Zoom as an option at a general board meeting? Um, that was from Jane Sassetti. So you, from the attorneys I've spoken with, you absolutely, there's no requirement that you need to maintain the Zoom meetings. The, the law is that you need to have these meetings at a physical place and so on. And, but so many people have done that. They're challenged with trying to people and people have gotten used to being able to attend that way. So we call them like hybrid meetings when you do, and that's a lot harder. It's very easy to do a meeting 100% in person, or it's very easy to do a meeting 100% virtually. But when you try to do it mixed, where you have a physical meeting spot for the board and maybe some owners and other people are remote, it can get really challenging to just get the audio and video and so on all figured out. You need cameras, microphones, speakers, and you need to have it all set up effectively, or there's some other newer tools that you can get that, that are a little simpler, but it can get really complicated. So you don't have to do it, but we see a lot of communities continuing to do it just because their owners have gotten used to it. We have a question from Patricia. How often should we have an independent audit of our books? The audit should be done on an annual basis by a third party CPA. And of course, depending on the size of your budget, an audit might not be required. You may only need a, a, a compilation. So best to consult with your CPA on that, but it should be on an annual basis. So Michael Eddington asked a similar question about Zoom meetings, and I think we've answered that. Um, our associate and then Lourdes says our association is very small. Um, few things are not community. Few things are not community to the association. What then? Yeah. So when you're that small, I think it's we're most of what we're talking to are associations with hundreds of hundreds of units. It's it's a lot easier, I think, in some ways when you're uh, when you're doing this, but you still need to make sure you're following the law. And I'm not sure the law if there's any exceptions as you get much smaller. Um, can you explain when you can go into executive session? Barbara asked that question. So there, honestly, Barbara, there's really not, there's no such thing necessarily in general as an executive session. I, I think if what you're talking about is the idea that a small set of the board members can get together and discuss things without it would outside of a public meeting where the board members can't listen, where uh, owners can't listen in. Those are closed meetings, and there's two reasons you can have closed meetings. Those are legal situations, pending pending legal, or uh, personnel. Those are the two ways you can have those kind of closed meetings. But otherwise, everything needs to be open. And even when you have those closed meetings, you still need to post them that you're having those meetings. Um, Kathleen says, I find that owners volunteer to be on the board and then resign their position, but still want to remain on the board. Example, secretary can't do the job anymore. So we have a board with no officers. Beth, have you seen that before? Yes, and that is usually a very bad outcome and it ends up with your community ending up in receivership. So that's definitely something that while people are usually reluctant to volunteer once they find out this information, uh, you might find more volunteers coming forward to pitch in and get the job done at the association. And I think Anna Maria Cardoso asked a similar, what are, what are the consequences of your building not having a board? And I think Beth just mentioned that, that it could go into receivership and that it can cost, uh, it can be very costly and inefficient. Um, and there was a question, what is this, Jonathan Griffiths asked, what's the suggested insurance indemnification coverage for HOA board members protect them from personal liability arising from a board member, um, from being a board member. So that you should talk about that with your agent, but it's basically DNO directors and officers coverage is the primary coverage that you would get uh, that would protect you and based on whatever actions have happened uh, in, in being a board member but you should talk to your agent about that in more detail because there's lots of other things that could happen that might be relevant 
but at a high level. We're not an insurance agency either, so, <laughs> but that's the basics. Uh, Juan Roach asked, see a lot of these are kind of legalish questions. So Beth and I are kind of hesitant <laughs> probably on some of these. Can the board use statutory reserve funds other than what it's intended for, Juan asks. And, you know, the general answer for that is, is no, not unless you get an owner vote to, to basically uh, move them, uh, reallocate them. You can't just use them. Uh, and especially in a condo, reserves aren't so much a thing in HOAs and the statutes, but there might be something in your docs. So you should talk to your attorney about that as well. And Kevin asks that uh, about the sidewalks, the board now wants the homeowners to be responsible for maintaining and cleaning the sidewalks when they are a common element. Is that enforceable? Uh, that would be something very specific to your documents. Unfortunately, in many communities, the area between uh, the sidewalk and the street, there is a lot of different ways it can be interpreted. So best to check with your association attorney. And then Debbie Marr asked, can committees meet together without inviting all res residents, social decorating rules and regs, et cetera? Um, you know, as long as they don't have a quorum of the board on them, I believe it's perfectly fine for a committee to get together because the committees aren't really making any final decisions on behalf of the association. So you can have those kind of informal meetings, but I'll tell you, in general though, it's better to be inclusive than exclusive. Um, even if it slows things down a little bit, you're better off trying to do it that way, uh, but you don't have to. Um, all right. I think we've gotten through all of our questions. So I realized this was a, we definitely didn't want to run long. And the main point of this is that you're going to learn, you're going to have a lot of questions as you move through this process and as you're, as you continue to learn. And the whole point is this board member primer has got a lot of resources in it and has links to other educational resources. There are Florida Association News events, educational events blog posts, all kinds of information. You can find almost anything there. So that's the key point we wanted to, to provide you here is to know that there's a resource you can use throughout your career as a board member. And we're gonna send you a link to that. And again, it's fairly short, but the key thing is it's got links to other resources. So that's the main thing we wanted to get across today. Anything else, uh, Beth? No, just wanted to thank everyone for joining. Be on the lookout for the links that we will send you after the webinar, which will be a very helpful resource to you as a board member. Uh, we're always here for you. Please do visit our websites and look for our, the, all the information and free events that we have. Um, and please do visit Florida Association News and our educational webinars. And I believe Ashley has now launched a survey for you to complete. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you could just take a minute, we would greatly appreciate your feedback on this and uh, everybody have a great week. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.